to work better, about improving yourself, about doing something about it. That's uh, what I want to talk about today. And I've been, this has been on my mind because I just came off of some work and um, I want to talk technique and technical stuff and programs and setup and software because uh, I've been bogged down with that recently and I want to, I want to chat about it because I think it's important. And that stuff uh, hopefully will ring true with whatever you're doing because it's not like the old days anymore. You can't just pick up a pencil and paper and just ship it off to somebody else. You actually have to know a lot more about technical things, things that maybe you're, you didn't sign up for, maybe you didn't expect that you're going to have to learn so much about it. But those are things that we, we, we need to know so that we can have better stories and we can uh, really execute our ideas in a in a better way. So if you have any technical issues, if you have any technical questions, bring those today and we'll see if we can handle them. I don't have all the answers, okay? But collectively as a group, maybe we do. So we're beaming to you guys on Instagram and Facebook and hopefully you guys out there can help us uh, solve some of these problems. So I wanna wanna chat about that and uh, I have a couple things I'll bring up in a second. And a little sip of my coffee here. Okay, so as a story artist, I talk a lot about drawing skills and getting your technical skills right when it comes to creating images and story, uh, storyboarding and visual storytelling. And that's something that we've been doing in the Visual Story course. And that's, uh, it's mainly talking about the theory, the ideas of why you make uh, good decisions when you cut and when you tell stories and when you have compositions and you have all these things, right? But now I want to get into a little bit more detail that I don't often talk about because I don't like to get bogged down on the technical side of things. I actually like to talk about just the story because that is the most important thing. But in order to get to the story, oftentimes what we need to do is we need to dominate the technical part. We need to dominate the drawing skills. We need to really master these things so that we're good at it. And then when we come to the storytelling part, we use those skills and execute on them easier. Okay, (laughs) so uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is uh, just the basic things that you should know now as a modern digital story artist. uh, One, you should be digital. It really that's that's what we're going to that's what we're up against. That's what we're competing with out in the marketplace. So there is no getting by anymore with just doing pencil and paper and scanning things in um, or even, you know, taking pictures on your phone or whatever. You have to you really need more. And I'm telling you this honestly because I want you all to succeed and you should know about a lot of software and programs and all the digital tricks out there. You really should be up to date on anything new that comes out and, um, and taking the principles that what you've learned from the past and applying that to new stuff. Okay. So the basic with that is, um, uh, let's start off with just some, some straight up digital techniques. Most of the time story guys are drawing on some kind of digital uh, tablet or some kind of format where they have like a digital pencil. Okay, so this is one. This is the the Wacom pen, right? And uh, <clears throat> here's my Wacom Cintiq. You can see that I'm monitoring my my chat here, and uh, so I can draw on this this bad boy, right? This is where I can I can draw stuff. So I'm not going to bring up the software because you know what you know what this is. I just want to point point it out to you so that um, it's not a surprise. And this, you know, you should you should be able to master both. So you should know the traditional skills, like grab a sketchbook, like traditional pencil and paper, and throw down and be able to, to knock out an awesome drawing that way. And then you should also be able to understand what it takes to make a really good digital, um, a digital illustration and a digital storyboard, right? Now, what that takes is, um, I think the basic thing that we can talk about is a program like Photoshop. I think everybody should know how to use Photoshop. All right, let's just get that out of the way. Most people out there probably already do, okay? And that's great. So Adobe Photoshop, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go, I think you can download like a trial. You don't have to sign up for the CC version. If I remember correctly, I think you can even get, they released free, a a CS2, um, Creative Suite 2 from Adobe was released free. They just no longer support it, but it had Photoshop there. And Photoshop really has not, I mean, the, the basic functionality of Photoshop has not changed very much over the years. Um, they're, they're adding new bells and whistles all the time. Like now it has a timeline and, 
you know, there's more menus and you can do all kinds of really cool um, tricks with VR in there. So yes, the, I think the, the, the latest versions are better, but the, if, you, if you're broke and you're just getting started, you can, I think you can find a copy of CS2. Dig around the Adobe websites or the forums or something and figure out uh, how you can download that for free. Um, I think it's even CS3 that they released that <clears throat> for free. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that, but go go look it up, okay? <laughs> Um, Photoshop is, is one you should know how to use. So that's basically having a digital canvas, um, being able to draw with that in a tablet. And the reason why is because most of the, the, the interface, uh, all the other programs will copy, right? Uh, just because Photoshop kind of came first. And it's, a, it's actually a really good drawing program. It's not meant for drawing. It's meant for kind of image manipulation. Um, but they have, now they have a lot of powerful tools that you can take advantage of for drawing, painting, uh, composition, uh, when it comes to like matte painting and stuff like that. And also animation, it has a timeline. So you can animate, if you can animate on it, you can also do storyboards on it in a, in a sequential way. So that's one thing that you should know about. <clears throat> uh, a lot of guys think, I think got a lot out of, uh, I did a tutorial and I got a really good response for um, what I do with the setup for um, in Photoshop. And uh, if you guys haven't seen that, go to storyboard art and do a search or I think you just do a web search and I don't know, I think something like how, how I set up, search for storyboard art and how to set up Photoshop for doing storyboards. And you can see my basic setup, um, it's actually quite simple. I keep it as simple as possible. So Photoshop is one. The other ones that you should know about are, um, let's talk about drawing programs first. Toon Boom, that's one that is, uh, that's really come up in the industry now and that's storyboard specific. So Toon Boom Storyboard Pro, you wanna learn that. Um, again, download all of the like free trials and everything. The like, student versions are really inexpensive. Um, An educational license. If you're just testing something out, you can do that. So make sure you know that one. That's something that's also really easy. Once you you can watch a couple tutorials and you can pick it up in less than a day. It's actually not that complicated. You can get complicated with any of these programs, but um, that's not that one's not that bad. Okay. Um, the next one is uh, I think just for drawing. Another basic one that I really like is Sketchbook from Autodesk. That was released free, and I really love the drawing tools. I'm a real big fan of that and the marking menus and the, and the, the very simple interface there. So check out uh, Sketchbook. There's another one that's, um, that some developers have um, come up with. It's called a Storyboarder. I think by Wonder Unit is the name of the company. That's also free, and it's a storyboard-specific program. Um, and I think it's it's coming up. It's really it's good and for for the price you can't beat it. Okay, Procreate that's another one. I'm actually not that expert in Procreate, but I've used it a couple times and it's it seems really great. And if you know Photoshop, you pretty much know how to use something like Procreate. And then the stuff that I see on Instagram and all over the place is actually really inspiring. So I recommend you use that too. You can try it out. Um, I think they also just released a timeline. So if you have a timeline, it's really good. Any program that has a timeline like like Sketchbook, Photoshop, Toon Boom, and hopefully now Procreate will you'll be able to, to do storyboards. Just make sure you're supposed to, you can export these things in the proper way. And I'll get to the export stuff and all that all that crazy digital thing um, in a second. Okay. The other the other programs that I think you guys should um, should really know about and learn are uh, some things in the Adobe suite. So I am a subscriber to the Adobe package. I have the latest CC versions, and I'm a real big fan of Premiere and After Effects. So those are two that I use, um, well, let's say three. So Photoshop, Premiere, and After Effects. Those three programs you can really do a lot with when it comes to storyboards. You create your animatics. You can import the drawings that you do in 2D from Photoshop. Photoshop you bring those into um, uh, uh, Premiere right away, and you can start editing. If you have something complicated like a series of camera moves or some kind of parallax effect, you can bring those into uh, After Effects, and then you can do some uh, some really cool tricks, almost like a, the traditional 2D, um, like like the plain cameras that they use when they were shooting um, 2D animation. Like back, I'm talking like Walt Disney era, where they're doing that um, with the multiplane cameras. Uh, you can simulate that in After Effects and do even more stuff. It's like th there's like almost no limit. Then you export that out to a. a, a Adobe Premiere, <laughs> I'm getting confused with the programs, and then uh, and then you can continue your edits and then you export the movie file from Premiere. I remember the days when it was just so painful to go back and forth from those programs. The export process was terrible, it was slow, 
and uh, but now they really streamlined it. Now there are because of the file sizes are getting bigger, it's always going to get bogged down for stuff. But um, those three programs work really well together. Um, they 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 do a good job. So I recommend you learn those programs and you know the the, the interfaces of each one of those because you never know when you're going to have to actually do something on your own, create an animation on your own, create an animatic on your own, do some kind of visual effects or some kind of compositing. A very simple compositing, but when it comes to storyboards, you can still do this stuff and create a parallax effect that gives a lot of depth with your with your images, and that you would do that in After Effects, right? Now you can go crazy and do these things in like Houdini and Nuke and all of these other really pro visual effects programs. Now I don't know how to use those programs, and uh, I would defer to those experts that are doing that. But when it comes to just you know general basic stuff for storyboards, you can really do a lot with something like After Effects and Premiere, okay? Um, let me, let me go through, okay, so that covers kind of the, the software stuff. I would also recommend, uh, that you guys get into 3D software. Now I, I, I went kicking and screaming into kind of 3D stuff back in like the, the 2000, early 2000s because, um, I actually learned how to animate in 3D in school and stuff, but I, I didn't, I'm not, I wasn't that into it. <laughs> so, um, so I avoided doing 3D for a long time, but I, I am. Surprisingly, I'm actually a technical person by necessity, not because I like to be technical, but it's because I need to solve a problem. And in order to solve the problem, I will open books, I'll watch tutorials, I'll do whatever it takes to actually get to my result. And so with 3D, I learned how to do that. And uh, I wouldn't consider, I certainly wouldn't consider myself an expert compared to some of the guys I've worked with because um, that is, those guys are amazing. Some of the guys that I've worked with at ILM and, and Pixar and, and all of that, they would they run circles around me when it comes to 3D, but um, I know the basics and I know how to. I don't move. I know how to move cameras. I know how to animate characters. Um, I don't know how to model. I don't know how to rig. So at least I would recommend that you know the interface with the 3D software. And something like Blender is free and it's also relatively easy to learn if you just watch a couple of tutorials and you understand the basic structure of that. Okay. Um, and I see you guys are chiming a bunch of questions. It's already really good discussion going on. I'll hit up some of these in a second, but I just want to shout out a couple of um, tips first and then we'll get to these things. So keep on keep on typing this in because this is great. Hopefully we can solve some of our anxiety when it comes to doing technical things. Okay, next off, um, I want to talk about file formats and aspect ratios. These are things that are native to the film world, and also just now that's becoming more common. I remember when somebody said something like aspect ratio back in the day, most people don't understand what we we're talking about, but really it's just how horizontal or square your format is when you're doing a storyboard, okay? And um, this is really relevant because every single project that we work on is going to have a, an aspect ratio, whether it's circle or square, you, there's still an aspect ratio. And that aspect ratio is going to have a corresponding resolution size. So I think something pretty common, like the aspect ratio on your phone, on most televisions, is 16 by 9. Okay, it's just how long, how tall the the frame is versus how wide it is. Okay, that's basically what that means. Um, HD is 1920 by 1080, and these are pixels. You guys should know what I'm talking about, and if you don't, you have to do your research and figure it out because these are things that should be common to your, just to the, just your film language when it comes to uh, resolutions and things like that. So this should not be uh, mysterious. So if I'm talking gibberish to you, that's a clue. You got to look this up and figure out what I'm talking about. So aspect ratios and resolution sizes. Now you got, that's your standard HD, which is 2K, right? Um, which is considered, you know, 2000, right? 2K um, HD resolution. Now there's 4K which is like 3840 by 2160, if I, if I remember correctly. I'm not exactly sure on those numbers. Those are the pixel ratio sizes for 16 by 9. Um, and, it, and it doubles each time you go up. So that's considered 4K. Now there's 8K, and there's probably eventually going to be 16K, and, and, and probably one day there's going to be 32K. So we're all going to have these ultra HD um, high resolution formats that I think we're going to be working at. and um, the, the, basically, what you should know is that how these formats work with, with each other, how to create them in each one of these programs, and how to export them correctly in those formats. Okay, so that makes sense. Now, 
I'm also going to hit you up with something else that you probably didn't expect. There is virtual reality and stereoscopic formats, and I've been battling with that this week, and it's uh, it's actually been a lot of fun, uh, despite some of my, uh, you know, running to walls and 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 just beating my head against <laughs> the desk to try and figure these things out. But I'm working right now on a stereoscopic VR project that is 360 and 180. Okay, so hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about. 360 degrees means it's shot, so you can uh, you have a, ca a spherical camera that can shoot all around you and when it's projected it's actually in an equal rectangular format that is horizontal it, it like unwraps that spherical uh, format and you get a like a rectangle what it looks like it looks like this kind of wavy um, I don't know like distorted image but when you actually wrap it again uh, you can do this inside of After Effects or Premiere or some other kind of um, VR program like um, like a game engine like Unity or Unreal, right? And again, these are things, these are terms that you guys should be familiar with. And, uh, and that way, uh, when you unwrap it, it looks like you can look all around as if you're in a room, okay? Um, I also have 180 footage, which means it's 180 degrees. That's just in front of me. Everything else is black behind. And, uh, and we're working with that. Now, I also have stereoscopic flat footage, which essentially is not, it's not 360. It's not 180. It's just, it's just flat but it's stereoscopic so you have a left eye and you have a right eye both of these things can have an over under uh format where you do it or you can have a side by side format but you have a left eye and you have a right eye and you're always doing it so i had to call up a friend today and he um helped me resolve an issue when it, when stacking my left eye and right eye footage together to actually create a visual effect so all of these things were really really challenging when it comes to these formats and it's all new so how do you, what do you do to basically to figure this out? You know, you look on tutorials, you ask questions, you go on forums, you might come to our Facebook page and, and figure out, you know, ask some people who are experts there if they've done anything like this before and, uh, and figure it out. And if you do figure it out, be nice and create a video or tutorial and show people your working method because I think I'm going to do some of that with some of these techniques, especially when it comes to storyboarding for VR which not many people have solved the particular problems that I'm running into and, um, and I'm out there to solve them. So I think, I think we got a handle on it. It's not just me. Like I said, I called up a good buddy to, um, to help me figure this out today and, and uh, he's much more expert on this than I am. And so he point, pointed me in the right direction. All right, so let me get to some of these, uh, these questions and see what you guys are talking about here. Yeah, okay, awesome. Great to see, great to see you, Chad. So Photoshop is largely just adjusted how some things worked for the last few updates. Um, some better, uh, others for worse. So transfer, <laughs> uh, transform tool is a giant. Uh, all right, so Chad is basically saying that we got some updates from Photoshop. Some are good and some are bad. Um, or, you know, I guess it's all a matter of opinion. You can also, if you're a CC subscriber, by the way, for Photoshop, you can use previous versions. You can download previous versions. And if you really liked you know, CS6 version, uh, they'll still allow you to use it. Um, I mean, I, again, I've used, used almost every single Photoshop version as it came out. And most of the time I get used to one. And so when they change it on me, I'm like, why, you know, now I can't find the button that I need. The user interface is different. So yeah, I know it's a, a real pain in the ass to try and like do it again, but, or relearn this stuff. But sometimes it's beneficial because if you're on a new production, you have to go to a new studio and they're using a different version from yours, you should be familiar with this stuff, or at least be able to pick it up relatively quick, quickly, okay? Uh, oh, great shout out to Schoolism, even has a course specifically on Procreate to make the most of it. Awesome, that's great. Speaking of Schoolism and the people that are um, sponsoring the Lightbox Expo this year, that's, I just wanna put a, a little side note that we're gonna be uh, participating in the Lightbox Expo online. We're actually sponsoring that. We're one of the contributing sponsors there, which is great. It's nice to be part of that event. More to come shortly because there's uh, there's some good things planned, uh, story wise and also lightbox wise. Okay, uh, Wahab likes Procreate. Awesome. How many files should somebody save when working on a project? Um, I'm not exactly. So this is a question from Alejandro Guzman. I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. How many files should somebody save when working on a project? But let me give you a general tip when it comes to working with your files and saving them. Okay, so this is a giant warning that I'm gonna tell you. If, you. if you're working with anything digital, 
okay? You need multiple copies of what you're working with. So God forbid the, the power goes out, your computer blows up, your hard drive fails, anything like that happens. You have to count on that actually happening to you, okay? Seriously, you got to plan for this stuff. So if you're working on any file, anything important, you should have at least three copies of it. Right? You should have your local copy, which is something that you're saving to some folder that you can work with quickly. You have two external copies that you either have that you have on two separate drives. You can also have a copy to the cloud, like one of those extra, like for three copies. Um, that third copy could be something to the cloud, something like Dropbox or a Google Drive or some other kind of external thing like OneNote Drive from Microsoft. Um, iCloud, whatever one it is, but make sure it's it's somewhat safe. Now, cloud stuff too can also disappear, so that's why you have three copies at least redundant. I would get really uh, paranoid about stuff that I was working on at Lucasfilm, even internal to the studio, where they would back up their stuff every single day, and if you know something catastrophic were to happen, you could call up the IT guys and say, "Hey, I need a backup from two days ago. Do you have it?" And uh, most of the time they would. That, that actually never happened to me. But I would have a local copy on my drive. I would have a network copy there. And I would have a third one uh, somewhere else on another like shared folder that I had within the Lucasfilm network so that I never lost work. I was so paranoid about that stuff because it, it's the worst feeling if you're working on something for even a couple of hours and it goes away. And we've all had that happen. But this is why my recommendation to you, and this is to answer your question, Alejandro, how many, how many copies of a file that you're working on that you should have. I recommend it, like if you're at least at the end of the day, or maybe you can push it to the end of the week if you're working on a particular project for an extended period of time, grab that working file, copy it, certainly save it as you're doing, as you're doing work, but then copy that file to two other locations and then you'll be safe, okay? Trust me on this. You'll save your ass if you do this stuff, okay? All right, the next one, oh, the next tip that goes with that too is how many times you should save your stuff. Um, I also recommend doing multiple versions, multiple iterations of your of your working files. So let's say you're working, and I do this every couple of hours, if not like minutes. Um, so certainly if I'm working, I do something, probably by half an hour, I'll save it. I'll make sure I do a control S and save anything that I'm working on. The other thing that I'll do, I'll do a save as, and I do multiple iterations and versions of this stuff. So I could have on a particular storyboard sequence, I might have up to 20 or 30 versions of that sequence that's building up to different incremental changes. And I'll do save as stuff. And the same thing happens. I've had files, individual files corrupted on me. And so this is where you really want to save yourself a lot of heartache and make sure you have uh, multiple iterations. So if that particular file that you're working on gets corrupted, at least it only gets broken to the certain point that you're working on. You go back to a previous iteration, you can bring those up. I've done that multiple times and it's a pain, but I've reconstructed some of my, my files and my sequences that way and it really saved my ass. So that's what I'm talking about with this stuff. <laughs> okay. Excellent question for my buddy here, Wahab. What's the best all-in-one program? That's probably a good question for you guys uh, out there. If you're asking my opinion, I think, um, I think Photoshop has, has got to take the, the cake for this one. That's my opinion, of course. So, you know, everybody's going to have their preference. But I would say if I was stranding on an island and I only had one program that I could use, I would probably pick Photoshop, even above TV Paint or Toon Boom or Blender or anything like that. Because uh, Photoshop really is that versatile. Um, it's got a timeline. It's got decent drawing tools. You can import brushes. You can save actions. So it's pretty... It's pretty standard when it comes to that stuff. Um, cool. All right, let me let me hit you guys up with your questions that you're hitting me. Awesome, it's so good that everybody's joining us here for this. Yes, okay, so. <laughs> this is awesome, so Erwin999. So you have many questions, buddy. All right, where can I get more questions answered? I'm really looking for more guidance. Friend, you come to the right place. Okay, so let me point you to. <laughs> Let me point you to the storyboard, uh, our, our Facebook group. That's probably the best place to go because you're going to have some community people there um, who we have our community mentors, but you're also going to have like participants that are going to like hopefully answer your questions there too. Um, so that's storytellers, Visual Storytellers United on Facebook. Just do a search or you can find the link on our storyboard art page in the forum section. 
Uh, we've moved our forums there because I think just Facebook is has it's better. It handles things better than any forum software that we've found. Um, that's probably the best place to ask your questions. If you want something private, just email us directly, um, either on Instagram or uh, or Facebook or any social media, LinkedIn too. But then just a straight up email works too. So story at storyboardart. Um, Dot org and that way uh, we'll get the message and it, you know it's handled by our, our customer team and they will filter it to the place that it needs to go and we can hopefully get back to you um, uh, for that and since you have money send it our way <laughs> I'm just kidding buddy all right save your money okay uh, let me see what other questions you got here so that goes for everybody by the way if you have questions and you want to hit us up directly please do we love answering questions. I love, um, I personally answer a lot of questions. I'm part of that community, that, cu that customer service team, and they send me questions, and I, I go through all that. I'm working through the Visual Story course, and we've got uh, you know, a team of people that, that are there to help you. So that's, that's what we're set up to do. Um, okay, let me ask, answer some of these questions. So this one is great from... Paranavesh, uh, let me see if I can get to this question here. Please explain what is the thinking process to plan scenes. Now I'm going to spin this um, in in a to to get to what we're talking about here with our with our technical discussion that we're having today. But um, when we're planning scenes, now there's certainly the theory about it, and um, and and what you want to do when you're starting it is, and I've talked about this before, you have a thumbnail pass, you're really thinking about the process, and then you, you do a rough pass, and then you want to go and look and see how that's doing, and then you do a finish pass, and then you might do multiple iterations of that. That's usually the process, okay? Now the setup is how you want to do this, and, and we'll, let's talk about the digital setup. Most of the time, even still, that we're working on 4K and possibly 8K resolutions if you have a really high-res production, the storyboards only have to be relatively um, relatively HD, so it doesn't have to be that big. 1920 by 1080 in an HD format is good enough for now. That might change, but for now, that's fine. So most of my files are in HD format, 2K format, and that's how I start them. Now, you can also go to Storyboard Art and download some templates if you, if you want to do that. That's all free. You can create your own. You can do a search and, and find some templates there. That's what I would. Um, that's what I would do when it comes to uh, starting and planning out your scene. So that's a technical uh, question there. All right. Um, hey, cool. <laughs> we got a question about the mentorship and a pricing question. So that's you, Irvin. Um, uh, you know, that's a good question. We the last time we want, launched our mentor, mentorship, uh, it was. If I remember correctly, it was 1,500 to 1,700, depending on the, the payment plan that you guys that you know you could you could select. Uh, actually, first I should back up a second. What I've talked a little bit about what we're going to do for the mentorship. We're coming up to that. We're looking to launch that in September. I don't have the final details yet, so um, I'm looking to confirm that with our team that we're going to put that stuff together. It's actually going to be really exciting. We have some new surprises for for people, and we don't have the pricing set up yet, but most likely will be that. Um, now you might say, wow, that's a lot of money. Now this, this mentorship is not really for everybody. These are for people who are ready to really up their game and get mentored by myself and a couple other guys, a couple of surprises that we're going to have on there for other instructors for that program. And it's a year long intensive program where we go through 12 exercises that are designed to push your portfolio forward. And we meet every two weeks to discuss the progress. So we want people who are really serious that want to improve and really have a passion for doing storytelling. Now, all levels are welcome, but you just really have to be able and to, to dedicate the time to improve your art. Now, I think most of the guys that are on here listening would want to do this because uh, if you do this, you're going to be able to have a better portfolio and have a better like chance at getting jobs. That's the whole point of this. We don't structure, especially not the mentorship. This is not a thing. It's not a hobby. Thing. It's not like you can draw on the side. If you want to do that, that's fine. You're still welcome to take the course, but it's directed at people who really want to work and do something really cool and creative on, in a collaborative way at companies like Netflix and Disney and DreamWorks and Pixar. That's what we want people to, um, to advance to. And we have some really amazing artists who are now working in the industry 
and they've hit us back and it's great to have that network now. So it's also, that's included there. So once we have more details, I'll, I'll hit you up about that. Okay. And, um, anyway, cool. <laughs> Let me go to some of this, um, other questions here. So this one from Jason, do you do your thumbnails on paper? Oh, Jason Confessor on Facebook. Thanks my friend for uh, asking these questions. Do you do your thumbnails on paper? Like when you're in your meetings or do you use an iPad and do thumbs on that? You know, I'm kind of old school, so I will take a, a, an old sketchbook where, you know, most of the time the scripts are printed that, at least on the productions that I've worked at. And I will just, you know, thumbnail on the side of the script or if I have a notebook, I'll just thumbnail on that. Um, and those are my first rough thumbnails, okay? So I actually don't carry around an iPad or a digital tablet. I just think those things wait, even though they're getting lighter and lighter, I just think I don't want to carry around a clunky, heavy, you know, digital piece of paper. I'd rather have the lightweight sketchbook that's a little more portable, in my opinion. I don't have to power it up or charge a battery. So now I know guys who do that, who carry around their iPad, and that's fine. That's cool. And the, certainly the results are great. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just not in, into that particular method. Um, but check this out. So I, once I get those thumbnails, I will go into my computer and set it up on my on my Wacom tablet and start drawing there. And I usually do my thumbnails now in an HD format right from the get go. So it's at full resolution. And even though I'm drawing really small and I'm you know like making things very simple in a thumbnail, I do them high res so that when I go to clean them up, I can clean them up on the same file or a new layer on the same file, right, in a different version. So so that's um that's what uh, that's what we're doing with that. Okay. Um, Great question here for Alejandro Guzman again. So PNGs or JPEGs? That's a really good question. From what I understand, maybe some of you guys who are a little more technical on this can help us out with that answer. I actually, when just out of uh, tradition, I normally export JPEGs, high-res JPEGs um, that are mostly uncompressed for my storyboard because they actually don't weigh that much. An HD file at 1920 by 1080 is actually not that heavy. It's probably around... I don't know, 500K, maybe it gets up to a, like one megabyte at the most, which, you know, back in the day, that was a lot. Now it's not very much. So you, it, it's a really lightweight 2D export uh, when you're doing these individual files. PNG is actually um, even lighter because uh, just the way that it's compressed and the quality is still really good. So either one of those are fine. I think what you want to do is just um, is ask your production what they prefer and uh, make sure that it's at the correct resolution uh, most programs will read any of those image files tiff jpeg even photoshop files are pretty pretty universal so you can do photoshop files and bring those directly into premiere of course it's the same same company so like adobe will be able to read a photoshop file but you can also export jpegs and it'll bring it into to premiere read that you can read pngs in premiere after effects and all those programs um, it's really your preference and what kind of, um, what kind of compression that you want and what kind of end file resolution quality that you want. I think when it comes to file size and quality, I think you're, you're good going with JPEG or PNG. The other thing to think about if you want, if you want to email this to anybody, if you're going to upload this on a shared program like Dropbox, it's a real, it's a good idea to keep them relatively small, keep them HD, but you want to compress them. So the quality is still good but that it's not a very heavy file size, okay? So hopefully that, that makes some sense. But basically you can use whichever one you prefer, okay? Um, speaking of file formats, uh, that's another one that's a really confusing even for me when I'm trying to export movie file formats. And this one I should probably confer to a you know, couple editor buddies that I know um, that work with file formats all the time. From what I know, uh, and this is why I really love Premiere, is because they have a lot of export uh, presets that you can use. And I just use the basic export preset for Vimeo or YouTube. And it usually does that at uh, a QuickTime H264, uh, I think I believe the codec is. And if you don't know what a codec is, uh, you should look that up. But uh, it's the basically the file format for your movie file. And I just use those Adobe presets and it usually gives the right type of, um, of 
for one, you want to make sure it's the same resolution and aspect ratio as the working file that you're using in a program like Premiere or Toon Boom, etc. And then when you export it, make sure that um, it has the right bit rate and all that. So that's why I just I click that preset and most of the time it's ready to go. If you're doing something like VR, virtual reality, it's a little more complicated. There's a couple more settings you have to you futz with. And also the render time can be a little bit bigger because, um, because you're digging big, usually uh, dealing with larger files. Okay, so video movie file formats are just a pain. And maybe you guys out there can actually help us uh, <laughs> di dissect some of this. But I, I stick to the basics. The other cool thing about something like Premiere, it's just the render engine that it's using now is so much better than previous years. Um, even five years ago, it was just painfully difficult sometimes to render out movie files and animatics. Now it's excellent. I can do it in minutes. It's really, really fast. Um, again, I'm not doing anything that particularly complicated. And I have done a couple complicated things, and it still renders really well. Um, and it's all really integrated. You can even upload it directly to a program like, um, or to an app like YouTube, uh, Vimeo, and that kind of stuff. So, and even Facebook. So that's really, really cool. Uh, oh, that's a good comment here from Chad. Thanks, buddy. So I'll just say this out loud for people um, so they can, they can understand what we're talking about. So Chad mentions that if you're doing something for animatics that requires layering, you want to use PNGs, JPEGs don't allow for transparency in that aspect. That's a really, really good point. Um, so if you're doing anything that needs to have a transparent background, right? So a couple layers, and let's say you only drew your character, and you want the background to be on something else, you'd probably want to export that in a PNG file because that pres preserves that transparency. Great, great point. I totally forgot about that. Um, JPEGs do not, uh, do not have a transparency. It's going to be completely opaque, even if you... Even if you have a blank background, it'll it'll um, export it either as black or white or whatever your background color is. So um, that's one thing to keep to keep in mind. All right, <laughs> cool guys. This has been a really great discussion. And again, if you have any more questions, hit us up on our Facebook group or email us directly. We're here to help, and uh, hopefully we can point you guys into some awesome results. So keep those coming too. If you have something cool to show, share it with us. I want to see. I think we all want to see. <laughs> All right, friends, we'll talk to you later. See ya.